Judy Faulkner, founder and CEO of Epic, and moderator Moira Forbes, executive vice president of Forbes, will discuss healthcare data and the COVID crisis. During COVID-19, the need to share insights generated from electronic health records became more important than ever with a sense of urgency that sparked an unprecedented collaboration amongst doctors, scientists, hospitals, and other stakeholders. In the middle of the pandemic, Judy Faulkner launched the Epic Health Research, Research Network to empower that data sharing among them. Over 100 million patients are included in that database. The founder and CEO of Epic is here to tell us about this new initiative. Judy, welcome, thank you. Hi, Maura, thank you. You were such a pioneer in electronic health records. You founded your company over 40 years ago, uh, which is one and a half employees, $70,000. Fast forward today, over 10,000 employees, $3 billion in revenue. And what's extraordinary is over 225 million patients uh, within the U.S. Are, are within your system. This offers, obviously, extraordinary and rich data. In May of last year, you launched the Epic Health Research Network to really bring insight to bear uh, during the heart of the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit about that effort, the impetus behind it? Um, and how it began to roll out as to where we are today? Well, of course, with COVID-19, almost everybody was scared. What is going on? What is this new disease? And so we had so much data there. We started looking at that data. And then when we started looking at it, we said, what do we do with it? How do we get it out? And we thought about getting it to some of the very prestigious and well-known journals, but it would take too long and uh, so many people were getting sick so quickly. So we decided to create our own journal, ehrn.org, epichealthresearchnetwork.org, that would publish what our findings were. And uh, because there were 100 million patients in it, we immediately had records from patients, de-identified, limited data set. Uh, we immediately had a lot of good data that we could share. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is that only about 10% of medical decisions are based on evidence-based medicine and too much is based on anecdotal information. So we wanted to get the data out quickly. What we did, which I think is really interesting, is we knew that it couldn't be peer reviewed, but we also uh, knew that it had to be accurate. So we created two teams. Each team had doctors, data scientists, software developers on it, and they were given the same charge, but they were also told that they couldn't talk with each other. So they each worked independently, and then we compared results. It was a really interesting way to get a simultaneous peer review. And I love that acceleration, which the, the pandemic caused uh, around so many forces in terms of being able to really bring that muscle of the extraordinary and rich data that you have to bear in, in a very, very short time frame and get it into the hands of the, the people who need it most. I'd be curious because this was a new initiative for you all and also a new way in which all these stakeholders within the healthcare system were, were engaging with this data in real time around such a pressing issue. Can you talk a little bit about how that information was then used and, and helped doctors to treat COVID patients uh, and, and some examples of the way in which um, that was seen in day-to-day in -day life um, with the front lines of care? Sure, I think one of the first studies we did that was so important was the vent ventilator survival rate. People were putting patients quickly onto ventilators and the survival rate was terrible and one of our uh, health system CEOs just commented that they didn't have enough access to ventilators. So they were putting patients on their side, they were putting them on their stomach and he thought that maybe the survival rate was higher. So we started doing a study on survival rates with ventilators, which I think really helped a lot of people around the country start putting more patients uh, on their side or on their stomachs and not on ventilators. And I think more people survived. Uh, other things that we did that I think were interesting, uh, we looked at the severity of COVID disease in the elderly, in different, different ethnicities, 
in gender. And by finding out where the increased risk was, it could lead to better triage of hospital beds that were limited. Uh, we also looked uh, when hydroxychloroquine was uh, being questioned about does it have a, an effect on COVID-19, we looked to see if it and other drugs uh, would be helpful if taken in advance. And we didn't find any help on that. Uh, some of the other things that we found that were interesting was we saw a decrease in cancer screenings, a very significant decrease. What is that going to mean coming up next with respect to people getting more severe cases of cancer? And a big dip in childhood immunizations, which uh, some of the health systems now are trying to have programs to try to catch up on that. Obviously, this effort helped unlock, as you said, ways to think about um, better, more effective care for COVID, um, but also some of the ripple effects in, in terms of um, things such as screening and the like, um, the, the secondary issues and challenges um, that are being created given the, the data that you had um, in front of you. I'd be curious, has, how do you think um, this type of data sharing in, in a more real-time way um, will be brought to bear in terms of new therapies, treating patients um, in the future, and creating this exchange of knowledge in really an extraordinary way? What, is this, what does this mean for the future of care? Well, a few things. Uh, a lot of uh, people say that it takes between 14 and 17 years for new information to get uh, used. Uh, that's a big problem. When there is good new information and new therapies that should be used, how do you get that out? So I think this could help as it goes and feeds back to the physician taking care of the patient. So one of the things that we can do with Cosmos is when the clinician is seeing a patient Cosmos can then look at other patients who are similar to the patient that clinician is seeing and say something like 18,000 got drug A, 22,000 got drug B, 13,000 got operation C, and give the data about the successes of each of those to the clinician so the clinician can make a more valid decision that's based on evidence-based data. So that could come right away and not wait those 14 years. That's, I mean, that's such a staggering number when you say 14 years in terms of, of the um, cycle of innovation as it relates to, to health um, and, and the pace um, of unrolling that, that information is, is yeah. unbelievable. And hopefully, obviously, that, that will continue to change given the ways in which in the models um, that, that you're bringing to bear that others can, can learn from. Um, the data that you all saw, not just in terms of the, the, how patients were being treated, but the way they were being treated was also really interesting. I wanna shift gears to, to one other front and that's telemedicine. Obviously um, you saw this extraordinary surge um, in telemedicine doctor visits. Um, uh, at one point, I think your team, I read studied 2.7 million doctor visits, saw 2.7 million doctor visits over a six week period, um, extraordinary advances in telemedicine. That's going to and continue to, to roll back as we can be in person again. But what is the future of things like telemedicine and, and where do we go from here as it relates to that dynamic within the healthcare system? Well, it was really interesting, <clears throat> excuse me, watching uh, telemedicine and how that took off. Before COVID, telehealth was about 0.2% of the visits. At its height, depending on the area of the country and the health systems, it went to about 44% and in some cases to 85% of the visits. We're seeing it go down now. It's going down to a range between 14% and 25%. Where we're seeing it stay the most is with behavior health. So uh, I think the folks in behavior health are very anxious to continue it there. One of the things I thought was really interesting with COVID is that it allowed physicians who were staying home to use their equipment at home to still see patients using telehealth. 
And and obviously we we all know that the the need for behavioral health care is continuing to rise and climb in this country. And one of the silver linings, um, of course, of the pandemic is unlocking these new, more accessible and then scalable ways um, for, for care. Um, as we wrap up the conversation, you know, I, I started um, by mentioning that you founded this extraordinary company 40 years ago. Um, the past year with the pandemic has leapfrogged and shifted in, uh, our businesses in such profound ways and extraordinary um, rate of change in a matter of months. Uh, what changes do you think we'll see from Epic because of your experience with COVID-19? How has it reshaped how you think about the possibilities of, uh, of your company now, but also what it represents in the future? We have a saying here, when things are quiet, build. And things are quieter, not because we weren't very busy, but because we weren't traveling as much as so many of us are now. Uh, more homebound. And so what we did was really interesting, I think. First of all, we learned to do installs that were quicker and more remote. Secondly, we learned to take care of patients using the software uh, at home. So some of our health systems had just too many patients for the beds, but they needed to be cared for. So they sent them home and the software began to care for them uh, hooking up devices and sending the data back to the health systems. Uh, it was really a, a wonderful new way to help take care of patients, but at their home. And then if the patient was getting worse, it would alert the health system to come in and intervene. Uh, we started creating a radio show called Epic Radio, and its purpose is to help the clinician use the software better so that the clinician can be an effective, good user uh, and take better care of patients that way and also enjoy the system more and find it easier to use. Uh, we also cr are creating, and Epic Radio is due out in another month or two, uh, a website called Epic Share because almost all of the executives of our health systems want to know what are the others doing that they could stand on their shoulders and do too. So that is Epic Share. So those are some of the things we're doing right now that probably wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for COVID. Well, uh, thank you, Judy, because um, sort of your pioneering and entrepreneurial spirit has created a, a company that has truly transformed um, the healthcare system uh, in this country and obviously uh, around the world. Um, and also in the, in the past year, you've been such an extraordinary leader and continuing to push new models of care and representing what's possible um, in terms of really bringing um, better care, breakthrough technologies, and this extraordinary collaboration of stakeholders in the healthcare system to bear at such a critical time. So thank you so much for those insights. And it was great speaking with you. Thank you, Moira. It was good to see you again.